Um, well, I want to thank you all for, for coming today. Um, spitty weather and all that. It was I, got, I landed yesterday and it was freakishly nice out. So that was thank you, thank you. For that. Um, <laughs> um, but I want to thank Patrick Barrett and uh, Richard Aviles and uh, Laura Hansen at the Haven Center for inviting me to speak with you all today. And I especially want to thank Professor Ben Marquez um, for this invitation and for his intellectual generosity and for um, I taught uh, Professor Marquez's books in a number of my courses. Um, at Haverford and at NYU, and so they always generate these amazing conversations, so I'm very pleased to be here. Um, so I'm a PowerPoint novice, so there won't be a lot of PowerPoint, and I'm fundamentally a Luddite, so there's really very little of that going on. There's some pictures, there's a video, um, but mostly that will just be like that, so just FYI. Don't expect a lot, just keep your expectations low. Um, since I do political theory, I mostly just wave my hands around and talk too fast. But that's <laughs> how we roll. Um, so the theme for my uh, visit this week was uh, Latino conservatives, thoughts on race, democracy, and the right. And as I said, the title of this first talk is on Latino Republicans. So the focus of my time will be on this new research that I'm doing in this area. And this is a new project that I'm working on at the Institute. So um, I'm really grateful for any feedback, questions, comments about this, because I'm still trying to think it through and figure it out myself. Um, but I thought I should begin by saying a little bit about my disciplinary location um, by way of introduction to this project, just so you have a sense of how I, how I come about this. So, so I'm a political theorist by training, as Ben said, with interest in contemporary political and social theory. And my work has broadly been based in the fields of democratic theory, feminist theory, and contemporary Latino and US race politics. So I situate my research at the intersection sort of of the humanities and the social sciences. Um, and thematically, much of my work has been concerned with questions of political membership, identity, inequality, and the way those forces shape deliberative uh, and participatory practices in the public sphere. And my work also draws on cultural theory and queer theory um, as well. So, so overall, I would say my research has thus far sought to explore the connections between political and social theory and questions of embodiment, identity, and racial formation, particularly as they relate to subjects marked as Latino in the United States. Um, and I'm using the terms Latino and Hispanic interchangeably here. Um, I'm referring to individuals living in the United States who trace their ancestry to the Spanish-speaking regions of Latin America and the Caribbean. So my first book, um, The Trouble with Unity, I was interested in theorizing various forms of Latino political consciousness. And I wanted to explore the various ways that Latinos in the US were enacting and articulating their efforts to gain political rights and political power and influence um, in the movement and post-movement era. So in that research, I look at sort of three critical moments of US Latino political history. I looked first at the Chicano and Puerto Rican movements of the 1960s and 70s. Uh, and then I then analyzed the emergence of Latinos as a pan-ethnic voting bloc that emerged during the 1980s, right, in which we stopped talking so much about Mexican-Americans or Cubans, <coughs> and we started talking about Latinos and Hispanics. In fact, if some of you remember, the 1980s was the decade of the Hispanic, in case you missed that. that that happened. Um, so finally, the book concludes by looking at an analysis of the political activism of the undocumented. And I looked particularly at um, the 2006 marches um, that took place across the country. And, and to analyze those events and to make sense of those movements, I put works of political theory in conversation with Latino studies and Latino politics. So, so for example, I turned to the work of Jean-Jacques Rousseau to try to understand some of the logics of the Chicano movement and um, works of various feminist theorists to understand what was going on at that particular political moment. And I turned to Hannah Arendt and her language of political action and labor to try to understand um, the, what was happening with undocumented political activism. So, I just, so that's been sort of my mode of inquiry, trying to bring the insights of Latino studies and Latino politics into conversation with the insights of democratic theory to make sense of contemporary political questions. And I just say that as a way of laying out like one reason why you may not see a lot of charts, for example, um, is this is sort of the way I've been approaching questions. Um, and one thing that's informed my earlier work and that informs this project is the idea that Latinos in the US have, have long been characterized as subjects on the cusp of political power and influence. All right, the infamous, like the sleeping giant. Right? Every time Latinos act politically, this term gets sort of recycled and deployed. Right? And if we never use it again, I will be very happy. Uh, but the sleeping giant has awoken. That's sort of the phrase we hear a lot. And one quick thing I'll say is I just think that this widespread invocation of Latinos as a sleeping giant is more than just an inaccurate political cliche. At a deeper level, I think the image presumes the existence of a civic cohesion within these populations, right? Particularly when it's invoked by advocates of Latino empowerment. So an implicit assumption of the metaphor is that Latinos 
will behave politically as an ethnic bloc. Right? The giant then signifies consciousness by materializing and expressing this kind of collective will of the Latino community. Um, and this is often defined in terms of a sort of unified vote or some other sort of embodied action, right? The, the marches were kind of a moment of the sleeping giant, um, was you know, used then. And so the term kind of implies a certain kind of political homogeneity, right? That in some crucial way, Latinos perceive themselves as some part of, some part of a larger whole, as a political community with shared interests and a common policy agenda, right? This kind of Latino Leviathan. Um, now, one thing I've been trying to highlight in my own work, though, is that if you characterize somebody as in the category of identification by talking about somebody as Hispanic or Latino, is the term's descriptive legitimacy has a startling lack of specificity, right? When we say somebody is, when we characterize somebody, you know, Joe is Hispanic, Joe is Latino, it tells us nothing about country of origin, gender, sexual orientation, citizenship status, economic class, or length of residence in the United States, right? None of that is clarified when we say they're Latino. Moreover, the category is indeterminate because as we know, Latino is not a race, right? So Latinos can be white, they can be black, they can be mestizo, they can be any combination thereof. So when we refer to Latinos in the United States, um, on the one hand, we sort of know what we're saying, but on the other hand, it is kind of a, a somewhat opaque <coughs> claim. So when we say Latinos in the United States, right, it's not clear if we're talking about farm workers living below the poverty level, or we're talking about middle class homeowners, urban hipsters, or rural evangelicals people who are white or black, gay or straight, Catholic, Mormon, Jewish, undocumented Spanish monolinguals, or fourth generation speakers of English only. Right? So in part, um, these homogenizing tendencies of Latinidad, right, the sense of Latinoness, I think those homogenizing tendencies obscure the serious and significant differences within these populations. And this is some of the stuff I've written about in the past. Um, but that tendency to conflate populations is not um, accidental and it's not incomprehensible, right? We're, we live in a world that confronts an interest group paradigm that rewards um, national over regional interests and that sees strength in numbers, right? So Latino elites, have, it makes sense to portray Latinos as a national, large and cohesive group um, capable of being organized around a recognizable set of issues. Um, talking about Latinos pan-ethnically also um, expands the population and geographical base for Latinos. Right, it projects us into the national arena. So rather than being understood as a series of regional subgroups, uh, you can speak of them as a national minority group akin to African Americans. Right? And so some of the language you've heard recently that Latinos have overtaken African Americans as the nation's largest minority group is premised on the pan-ethnic logic. Right? That's the only way we become the largest minority group, is if we'll group together. So the pan-ethnic paradigm for Latino elites and their advocates, it's been a belief that that's a better way to secure federal resources and gain national exposure. But the internal logic of pan-ethnicity is not just strategic, it's also emotive and experiential, right, as well. Latinos have been constituted as a group through the homogenizing effects of racism experienced by Latinos and other people of color. Asian Americans are another example of a pan-ethnic population that's taken this identity on. So it's been fostered by a climate of xenophobia in which the distinctive regional and cultural histories of all people of Latin American descent has been erased. Right? So given the experience of broad-based group discrimination, it's not surprising that Latinidad <coughs> emerges as a productive response to prejudice and racial stereotyping. In that sense, Latinidad is an attempt to evoke a sense of linked fate as the basis for a collective politics. So it has these legitimate logics that need to be understood. I just wanted to kind of clarify this, I think this sort of sets the stage for my new project. Um, so what I've tried to argue in my work is that while there are real and material incentives and logics for talking about Latinos as a group, we also need to develop approaches to identity that engage Latino heterogeneity uh, and think more deeply and creatively about the political possibilities of that kind of internal diversity. Right? So rather than seeing it as a hindrance to empowerment, seeing it as what kind of possibilities does it open up politically. So rather than conflating unity with empowerment, that we try to think about the diverse and even diverging ways that Latinos are acting politically and attempting to gain political power and influence. And so I draw on feminist theory and some of the category of women debates to look at how um, I want to sort of suggest a more post-structural approach that sees Latino identity as always historically and discursively <coughs> constructed. So given that, my new project is on Latino conservatives. Um, more specifically, this project focuses on Latino political elites who identify as conservative, 
and who seek to gain influence and support within the Republican Party, and who seek to increase the size of the Latino electorate within the GOP. Now, um, interestingly, there's no current book-length academic study of Latino conservatives. So uh, I was like, yay. Um, good for me. Um, um, it also means this will not be a comprehensive book. I'm just going to take a bite and hope others take other bites. Um, I think the gap in the literature exists for a couple of reasons. Um, certainly, scholars of conservative politics like Corey Robin or Joe Lowndes or Kevin Madsen, uh, Bill Connolly, um, as well as older works by George Nash or Richard Hofstadter or Thomas Edsel, they make virtually no mention of conservatives of color, right? what Angela Dillard has referred to as multicultural conservatives in one of the few books that's on this population called Guess Who's Coming to Dinner Now, um, <laughs> Angela Dillard's book. And so that idea of multicultural conservatives, right? they really go pretty much unmentioned in much of this literature. And so when they do talk about race in this literature, it's mostly in terms of the right's use of backlash politics, right? the Southern strategy, how the politics of nativism and xenophobia and anti-black racism have been used by the GOP. And there's a real history there to confront, right, that I want my project to deal with. Um, but what interests me is this literature does not really contend with how certain segments of various racial and gender and sexual um, populations have tried and found a home in the GOP. Mm -hmm. So Angela Dillard is one of the few people who's really looked at this, and her book looks at multiple groups. It looks at African Americans, predominantly Asian Americans, Latinos, um, and, um, and LGBT communities, the log cabin Republicans in particular. So there's very little that's been written on this on that side. On the other hand, in the field of Latino politics, uh, Latino studies, Latino conservatives have also somewhat been neglected. In part, I think, is because the field itself, the field of Latino and Chicano studies, came out of leftist and liberal identity-based social movements in the 1960s and 70s, and that body of literature and that body of scholarship very naturally tends to focus on uh, the history of racism and exclusion, as well as the politics of resistance and social justice. So given that, Latino conservatives, in that sense, are an uncomfortable population, right? They resist uh, the transformation of what An Anlin Chang has described in her book, The Melancholy of Race, as the transformation of grief into grievance. Right? Uh, Latino conservatives, if we want to understand grievance as the social and legal articulation of grief, we can see how Latino conservatives often resist that transformation of grief into grievance. Um, that resistance has often, I think, led Latino conservatives to exist as a kind of present non-presence in the field of Latino politics and Latino studies. Uh, the one group that is discussed is Cubans. Right? Cubans are Cuban <coughs> Republicans. Right? They're sort of the outlier of progressive Latinidad in some ways. Um, and I think, I mean, Ben's work on LULAC, for example, has discussed the complicated ideological terrain of uh, Mexican-American and Latino politics. Um, but overall, the field has not really engaged um, these questions in, in as much depth, perhaps, as it could. So I've been, in, I've been interested in many ways in having this project go beyond Cubans in Florida. So I wanted to show you a couple of historical examples. And this is where I will show you some pictures. Um, so for example, one of the things that's really interesting is how many Latino Republicans were firsts. Uh, it's just it's, a, it's an interesting fact. So this picture is of um, Romaldo Pacheco. Pacheco was the first Hispanic elected to the U.S. Congress um, in 1877. He was elected to the House of Representatives. He was a Republican. He also was the 12th governor of California. Um, he's the only Hispanic to have headed the Golden State when it was part of the U.S. When California was part of the United States. So he's first Hispanic in House of Representatives. Uh, this is Octavio uh, Octaviano Larasolo. Uh, Larasalo. Uh, he's the first Hispanic U.S. Senator. Um, he was the first Hispanic elected to the U.S. Senate in 1928. Um, he was, more specifically, he's the first United States Senator of Mexican-American heritage. Um, and he also served as the fourth governor of New Mexico. So it was an interesting kind of Congress governorship story here. Uh, this is Ben Fernandez. Ben Fernandez is the first um, uh, Hispanic to run for President of the United States on a major party ticket. He ran in the Republican primary in 1980 against Ronald Reagan, and obviously he lost. Um, but um, Ben Fernandez is interesting because Ted Cruz, when he was running um, in 2008, claimed he was the first Latino to run for president. And people said, ah, oh, Ben Fernandez, Ben Fernandez is the first one. Um, and so he, and he was. Um, he was also the founder and the first chairman of the Republican National Hispanic Assembly. Um, so, and he's Mexican American as well. So he's an interesting figure who I'm doing some research on right now. Um, another first, real quick. Um, Ileana Rose Leighton. Le I always her name is always weird to me. She's the first Hispanic female member of Congress, and we mostly know her as sort of a Cuban American 
activist. She was elected to Florida to Congress in 1989. She was the first Hispanic woman to serve in the House of Representatives. She was also the first Cuban American elected to Congress. And she's still one of the most you know, high-ranking Republicans in the U.S. House of Representatives. She's the only woman to have chaired the Committee on Foreign Affairs, right? Very powerful committee. And last but certainly not least, Alberto Gonzalez, right? The first Hispanic uh, Attorney General. Um, he was, when he was appointed Attorney General in 2005, not only did he become the first Hispanic to hold that position, but he became the nation's highest ranking Hispanic in the executive branch to this day. Right? So these were all Republicans, and I just think that's very interesting. Like, one question I have is, why so many Latinos, why are so many firsts Republicans? Right? What, what is that about? What does this mean, or does it mean anything? Right? That's a question I sort of have. Um, now, I'm going to go back so you don't just stare at his face forever. Um, which is, it's a nice face, but it looks like one of my uncles, but it's still looming. Um, so, in, uh, so one thing... I want to note that is in terms of the literature that I'm trying to look at, I'm trying to make sense of this, and much of the work in the field of Latino politics in political science that is focused on U.S. electoral and party politics, right, so the subfield of Latino politics that's looking at electoral politics, that centers, is centered on questions of political representation, much of that literature focuses on Latino voting patterns and participation rates. Um, and much of that work is primarily quantitative, um, based on state and national survey data, that's trying to understand Latino political behavior and explain lower voting rates, the issues of underrepresentation, um, some of the barriers to participation. And so some of the scholars that I'm engaging to sort of make sense of this work include um, Gary Segura at Stanford, Matt Barreto at the University of Washington, Rodney Hero and Lisa Garcia Bedoya's work, both at UC Berkeley, Marissa Abrahano and Michael Jones Correa at Cornell. Right? So this is sort of some of the literature in Latino politics on electoral issues are some of those folks. And that body of literature is very helpful to me, but I think additional logics, additional literatures are needed to make sense of the logic of Latino conservatism. And one of the contentions of this project is that to make sense of the appeal of Latino, of, to make sense of the appeal of conservative politics to Latinos, I think we need to attend to the performative, aesthetic, and affective dimensions of representation. In other words, rather than approaching political identities simply in terms of ideology and interest, right? And one thing we might want to think about is how does some of that survey data, which can be very useful, but how is that survey data a kind of static measure of those things, right? Um, rather than simply thinking in terms of ideology and interest, I want to, I think we also need to consider how our civic attachments are related to our aesthetic attachments, right? So what do I mean by this? Our civic attachments are related to our aesthetic attachments. My research on Latino conservatives asks, what does Latino empowerment look like? For Latino conservative elites or for conservatives trying to appeal to an envisioned and one might even say imagined Latino electorate, what does empowerment look like? What does it feel like? What aesthetic and affective images are deployed by the right when they're trying to appeal to Latinos? And how does this logic relate to the larger affective and aesthetic investments that currently characterize US conservatism? conservatism? is something I want this project to understand. So in that sense, I'm interested in the question of Latino conservatives from a variety of angles. Um, in part, I'm interested in what is happening to the Republican Party right now and its contentious relationship to the larger conservative movement. And I think we've all seen the various signs of the rights, various fault lines kind of coming out publicly, right? The Tea Party versus more establishment Republicans, all the um, various primary challenges that have been going on through the Club for Growth and these sorts of folks. Um, the shutdown over the debt ceiling, right? All these sorts of things. Um, as well as arguments within the GOP around how to confront issues like gay rights, reproductive rights for, for women, and comprehensive immigration reform, right? In all these ways, we're seeing, if not a, a party in crisis, at least a party at a kind of crossroads around how they want to approach policy and what their vision of governing ought to be. So we're also seeing demographic challenges, right? As the GOP's base is getting older and whiter at a time when the US is becoming more racially diverse and young people are less taken by some of the policy preferences of the GOP. So in one sense, this project is trying to understand the larger logic of um, what it, what's happening on the right. But I'm particularly interested in how Latinos are currently being figured in that debate. And one of the things I want to talk to and turn to now, so now all the setup is now I'll talk about something, actually. Um, but uh, one thing that's currently, I think, is interesting is the way Latinos are being figured by conservatives as either saving or destroying the Republican Party. 
<laughs> so on the one hand, Latinos are characterized as natural conservatives, right? Natural Republicans, traditional, hardworking, family-oriented, patriotic, religious, right? All of these things. This assertion that large numbers of Latinos identify with conservative principles and values uh, gained some credence when George Bush won 40% of the Latino vote in the 2004 presidential election. Right? Um, and the GOP has had other moments of high levels of Latino support at the presidential level. Uh, close to those numbers were, or maybe slightly above those numbers, was for Nixon in 1972. Uh, Latinos also voted in high numbers for Ronald Reagan in 1984. <coughs> so these moments have happened in the past um, where you're getting, you never up to 50%, but you know, in the 40s. So for the GOP at the national level, right, the hope is right, if they could just get or sustain 35 to 40% of the Latino vote, minimally, right? Uh, they can compete as a national party. Right? If they can't get that, they're going to be in trouble. Yet alongside this image of the Latino electorate as becoming aware of its kind of true conservativeness, um, an alternative account portrays Latinos as the cultural and demographic threat to the party. Right? This segment of the right, the fact that 71% of Latinos voted for Obama in 2012, proved that far from being natural conservatives, Latinos are irredeemable big government liberals uh, supporters of gay marriage, gun control, and Obamacare, right? So for this segment of the right, the GOP efforts to pass comprehensive immigration reform as part of their effort to uh, attract, win over Latino voters, is only going to backfire, smoothing a path to citizenship for nine million new Democrats, right? So by this argument, conservatives should give up on the dream of uh, winning over the Latino vote and work instead to limit immigration and mobilize white voters who didn't turn out in 2012. And that's actually an argument being articulated now. We just need to really dig in and find those white voters who didn't come out in 2012. Uh, the Eagle Forum is making this argument. Um, various members of Congress are as well. So what I think is interesting is in these two accounts, Latinos are a kind of adhesive force for the GOP, right? If they can just get their numbers back up to 2004 levels, then Latino voters will sort of patch over, Latino voters allow the party to kind of patch over its divisions and contradictions and remain competitive at the national level. On the other hand, for another segment of the right, the effort to appeal to Latino voters through things like immigration reform um, will only alienate the majority of Republican voters. Right? So in this scenario, Latinos are like a fracturing force in the party. So this dynamic is something I want to sort of understand. Um, alongside these arguments, however, of voters, whether Latinos are kind of, are they about rejuvenation or ruination, right? During whichever you think it is, a growing number of Latino Republicans are running for and winning national public office. While Latino Democrats elected to Latino public office still outnumber Latino Republicans by an 11 to 1 margin, currently they represent, there's been a 22.5% increase of Latino GOP office holders since 2006. Um, even more significantly, Republican voters have elected a surprising number of high profile Latino representatives at both the state and federal level, including currently the two national, the two governors, two, the two Hispanic governors in the United States are both Republican. Right, Brian Sandoval in Nevada, and Susana Martinez uh, from New Mexico. She's also the first Latina ever to be elected a governor in the US. Um, so I will show you their pictures very quickly. I will zip by these guys. Susana Martinez, um, Brian Sandoval. We've also elected, right now, out of the three Latinos who are in the US Senate, two are Republican, um, and all of them are Cuban, which is interesting. So the two, um, Marco Rubio, and of course, Ted Cruz. Um, so now, some of these Latino conservatives, the other thing that's interesting, if you look at the House, for example, and people like Raul Labrador from Idaho, some of these people are some of the most conservative members of Congress. Right? So they're not only, they're also, they, they represent a really interesting kind of um, diversity of ideology, even from the right. Um, now, one quick thing I should just note, um, in my research, I'm not going to be focusing overly on these figures. They're, they're important figures, and my book is going to be dealing with them, but I actually do want to also look at um, larger organizational structures that inform the Latino conservative movement. So I just want to really quickly stop showing you Ted Cruz's face. I know you want to keep seeing it. Um, and just note this. So one of the things is my research is going to be looking at, in addition to looking at these leaders, and I'll be talking about these guys today, but in my research, I'm looking at, in addition to Latino national elected officials, uh, like Cruz and Rubio and these guys, I'm also studying the Republican National Hispanic Assembly founded by Ben Fernandez, who you saw earlier. Um, I'm also doing research on the Latino Partnership for Conservative Principles, 
uh, and Alfonso Aguilar, who's the director. There's a new organization called the Libre Initiative that Daniel Garza is organizing. The Libre Initiative is a Coke-funded organization, so they have a lot of money. Um, a very interesting group. And I'm also wanting to look at some long-standing Latino conservatives who sort of have served as sort of public intellectuals for the right. So that includes Linda Chavez, who's written um, sort of, you know, on bilingual education and her memoir a couple years back. Um, somebody who's been writing about um, conservative principles since the 80s for quite a while now. And Lionel Sosa, who's sometimes known as the Latino Karl Rove, who's very close to George W. Bush and involved in his campaign in 2004 and credited often with some of the um, success he had in 2004 and appealing to Latino voters. So La Sosa has also written a number of sort of self-help books that I'm currently reading and working on and trying to think about how he, they're all about like getting rich and they're kind of these carny uh, self-help books aimed at Latinos. So I'm looking at him as kind of another figure who's doing this. And I'm also going to be interviewing the seven currently appointed field directors for the GOP that Izzy Santa is sort of heading up. They're trying to organize really targeting Latino voters um, in 2016 and beyond. And the final thing I'm looking at is the National Hispanic Christian Leadership Conference, which is the largest organization of Hispanic evangelicals. And that's led by Sammy Rodriguez, who's the head of that and who um, spoke at the RNC and speaks at um, you know, various conservative um, events. So, so that's where my, my, my book project is going to kind of deal with these organizations. So these folks that I'm looking at today are a, fig a set of figures in there, but they're not, they're not the, the main stars of it in many ways. Um, now, when we look at these sorts of figures, often Democrats point to the fact that candidates like Martinez and Sandoval and Cruz failed to win the majority of, Latino, of the Latino vote in their respective states. <coughs> right? They won the elections, but they didn't win the Latino vote. Right? The majority of Latino voters voted for the Democrats, the non-Latino, sometimes Latino, but the non-Republican the non candidates. So that fact is often used to sort of talk about these, these folks, Martinez, Cruz, Sandoval, as somewhat making them unrepresentative. Right? They are unrepresentative when it comes to most Latinos' policy preferences, right? since most Latinos voted for the Democrats. For Democrats, then, um, the fact that the majority of Latino voters have been more support, supportive of their party's candidates and policies is proof of their own legitimacy and their own representativeness, right? These conservatives are just kind of weird token outliers, you know, who, who get, who actually appeal more to white voters than they do to their voters of their own um, ethnic community. So this observation that Latino conservatives don't represent the majority of voters um, is, is also occasionally linked to a more problematic claim that they're not really Latino, right? Um, and so that kind of claim got made when Miguel Estrada, for example, in 2003 when George W. Bush tried to make him the first Latino to sit on the U.S. Court of Appeals, for the, for the District of Columbia, right? Rather than opposing Estrada simply for his lack of experience, he had no court opinions, he'd never served as a judge uh, prior to his nomination. <laughs> Organizations like MALDEF and uh, Democratic Senator Robert Menendez argued that um, Estrada's conservative views meant that while he, quote, shares a surname with Latinos, he uh, inadequately represented, quote, the Latino experience, unquote. Ten years later, recently, Bill Richardson, of the former governor of New Mexico, echoed this argument when, he, when asked about Ted Cruz. He said, uh, I don't think he should be defined as Hispanic. And then he had to kind of back up and say, well, I, you know, okay. Um, right, so such arguments tend to presume that conservatives hailing from marginalized communities, gays, African Americans, Latinos, that these people represent a sort of inconceivable minority too unfathomable and absurd to speak of. Right, and Senate Majority Leader Ted Reed kind of captured this when he was speaking at an event for Latino supporters. Bless you. And he said, I don't know how anyone of Hispanic heritage could be a Republican, okay? Do I need to say more? Right, so for Reed and other Latino leaders in the Democratic Party, the fact that, you know, um, you know, the fact that the majority of Latino voters don't support these folks demonstrates what Latinos really are politically, and they're not Republicans, right? So I don't want to try to settle this argument over whether Latinos are really liberal or really conservative, right, naturally conservative. Instead, my project seeks to explore how the Republican Party facing a growing Latino electorate, has approached the practice of representation. Put another way, rather than try to es establish criteria for labeling particular policies or politicians either representative or unrepresentative, um, I, I approach representation here as a dynamic practice of claim making and claim receiving. So I'm talking about representation as a practice of claim making and claim receiving. right? And to do this, I draw on the work of political theorist Michael Seward and his constructivist account of representation. So I'm going to say a little bit about Seward's work before I, before I finish. 
So in his book, The Representative Claim, Michael Sword argues that the prevailing orthodoxy regarding representation focuses too strongly, he says, on the definition of representation, what it is, and less systematically on the constitution of representation, what it does. Such an approach, as he puts it, quote, tends to overemphasize forms, roles, and typologies in political representation while ignoring or downplaying the constitutive dimension of representation, treating representation as a thing rather than an ongoing series of events, practices, and claims. And so in that sense, he describes um, political representation as a creative activity. And I just want to take us to a, a quote of his, because I think it's helpful in this regard. He writes in the book, he says, there's an indispensable aesthetic moment in political representation, because the represented is never just given unambiguous, transparent. A representative has necessarily to be creative. He or she has to mold, shape, and in one sense create that which is to be represented. She has to be an artist to operate aesthetically, to evoke the represented. So by trying to understand the multiplicity and instability of such claims, I think we gain a better understanding of how representative claims operate and how they resonate or how they fail to resonate um, and under what conditions they produce or fail to produce acceptance and gain legitimacy. And so that practice is really what interests me. So um, what I want to do now um, to sort of conclude is I want to discuss a few representative claims being made by Latino elected officials during their speeches at the RNC. And one of the things I'm going to be doing in this book is I'm using these speeches as part of my book's introduction to, um, and I wanted to talk about the RNC in 2012, the Republican National Convention, because Republican conventions or political conventions in general are weird birds, right? they're weird animals, they're, they're freaky little events, they're designed to kind of animate the base, you know, and make them feel better, but they're also, national conventions are also um, a place where um, people can step into the national spotlight, right? And you can think of Barack Obama's DNC speech in 2000, in 2004, right? I mean, that was a, an enormous political moment, right? That's an event, that's when somebody kind of enters public consciousness. Um, so for me, the RNC is sort of interesting. It's a, it's, a, it's a political introduction to a potential electorate, right? That's also what conventions do, and that kind of intrigued me. So, and the RNC in 2012 was interesting because of the number of high-ranking Latino conservatives present, right? And they're not only just Latino Republicans, they're, they're seen as the future of the party in many ways. People are talking about Susana Martinez running in, against Hillary Clinton in 2016. There's some drafting efforts there. There's talk of her being a, 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 a vice presidential candidate, potentially. Marco Rubio is being talked that way, but now he's kind of Republican roadkill. It's not clear what's going to happen with him. Um, it's likely that Ted Cruz will run in the Republican primary. So these folks kind of matter, at least um, for the time being. Now, if Sword is correct in his assertion that representative or representation is best understood as a process of claim making and claim receiving that is performatively and aesthetically produced, then the 2012 convention was a fascinating exercise in the making of representation, right? Now what is really interesting is that these folks existed in the 2012 RNC, they were very prominent after a primary that was infamous for its anti-immigrant rhetoric and proposals that many people saw as anti-Latino, right? This was one of the most um, sort of popularly known anti-Latino primaries that has happened in recent years, right? Mitt Romney promised to veto the DREAM Act during the primary. He referred to it as a handout, where right? he famously called for self-deportation of immigrants. Uh, Anti-immigrant rhetoric, um, focused on things like an electrified fence, right? Herb Cain, you know, one of the, one of the candidates suggested that. Um, and in fact, former Governor Jeb Bush and RNC Chair Reince Priebus called on candidates to tone down their anti-immigrant language during the primary for fear of the backlash it might provoke. So that interests me, right? How does one make sense of this paradoxical condition of increasing presence uh, and electoral success of Latino Republicans alongside the rhetorical assaults on a predominantly Latino immigrant population? Um, another interesting thing is that unlike at the Democratic Convention, at the Republican Convention, Latino Republicans um, did not speak in support of immigration reform. None of them mentioned immigration as a policy issue at all. They said nothing about immigration um, as a policy issue. Um, one of the reasons for that is they don't agree on it. The four Latinos who spoke don't actually agree on immigration as a policy issue. Ted Cruz thinks any efforts to talk about immigration reform is amnesty. Um, Susana Martinez is trying to get licenses taken away from undocumented immigrants and is more focused on, wants to focus on sort of hardening the border, whereas Brian Sandoval believes in driver's licenses for the end for unauthorized drivers. 
Um, and Ted and Rubio, as we know, has been all over the issue. He was part of the Gang of Eight, working on comprehensive reform, then he repudiated that. So again, what I think is really interesting is none of these folks could really speak with a, a, a collective voice around immigration. Um, and they sort of, so instead they didn't really, they didn't speak of it. It wasn't, it wasn't part of any of their speeches. Yet I also want to think about that silence as more than an omission. And I want to think about how aesthetic considerations might help us think about how, as Seward talks about, the impression of presence is constructed. Um, so what I want to suggest is that by appearing on the RNC stage, Latino Republicans provided the impression of presence to a GOP in search of a winning majority. Right? So while not in agreement over immigration, Cruz and Rubio, for example, both used their speeches to highlight the story of their struggling immigrant parents, and they crafted representational images of immigrants that endorse traditional Republican principles of limited government, personal responsibility, and free enterprise. And I'll show you a clip in a minute. Um, now, because Martinez and Sandoval are both children of Mexican-Americans born in the United States, they couldn't necessarily draw on an immigrant story in the same kind of way, right? Because they're multi-generationally Mexican-American citizens, right? Um, so they both constructed narratives highlighting their working class origins, right? In the hopes that um, listeners would recognize themselves in the claims that were being made, right? This kind of embodied support. So I just want to show you a couple of quick clips and then I'll conclude and talk about it. So this clip I'm going to show you is a clip of Susana Martinez um, talking about, she's talking here, um, telling the story of her and her husband's decision to switch parties. Right? She talks about how she used to be a Democrat, but now she's a Republican. It's like a, these, each of these clips are about a minute, and then I'll conclude. Um, so we'll see what she has to say. I have lost the courage to stand up. That we have now, what we have now are politicians. They won't offer real plans and only stand up when they want to blame someone else. And I don't say that just because a Democrat is in the White House. I was a Democrat for many years. So were my parents. Before I ran for district attorney, two Republicans invited my husband and me to lunch. And I knew a party switch was exactly what they wanted. So I told Chuck, we'll be polite, enjoy a free lunch, and then say goodbye. But we talked about issues. They never used the words Republican or Democrat, conservative or liberal. We talked about many issues, like welfare. Is it a way of life or a hand up? Talked about size of government. How much should it tax families and small businesses? And when we left that lunch, we got in the car and I looked over at Chuck and said, I'll be damned, we're Republicans. <laughs> goes wild. <laughs> um, they love that. Um, so here we see Martinez um, characterizing herself on the receiving end of a transformational representative claim. The speech in many ways I think highlights Seward's insight as he puts it that quote, elective claims are not as secure or accepted as many think and that the act of being representative is as he puts it far more dynamic, changing, unsettled, and unsettling process than is commonly thought. Right. So you see Martinez here both sort of narrating and making a representative claim and hoping. You know. And I love the fact that she also, like, they're going to have a free lunch because they're Democrats. They just want a free lunch. Don't they? <laughs> then she's transformed by her, by her, by her views. Um, another claim I want to look at briefly and then I'll, I'll conclude is I want to look at um, what's also going on here, I think, which we don't talk enough about, which is the aesthetic appeal of racial presence. Um, and here I want to show a clip of Marco Rubio, and I just want you to notice what happens when he starts to speak Spanish. And you know, this is sort of famously done at all these conventions, right? They speak a couple of words of Spanish, and they, you know, they often they don't speak Spanish really, so they have to say like a couple of es posible, and they, they sort of do that, and, and that's it, right? And that happens on the Democratic and Republican side, right? This, this sort of happens. Um, Rubio is a very good Spanish speaker. He's Cuban, he speaks beautiful Spanish. And so there's a moment here that he, he speaks, and I just want you to notice it. But, um, and then it's, again, it's another like a minute or something, and then we'll... I'll conclude and we'll talk. My mother was one of seven girls whose parents often went to bed hungry so their children wouldn't. My father lost his mother when he was nine. 
He had to leave school and go to work, and he would have worked for the next 70 years of his life. They immigrated to America with little more than the hope of a better life. My dad was a bartender. My mom was a cashier, a hotel maid, a stock clerk at Kmart. They never made it big. They were never rich. And yet they were successful. Because just a few decades removed from hopelessness, they made possible for us all the things that had been impossible for them. Many nights growing up, I would hear my father's keys jingling at the door as he came home after another 16-hour day. Many mornings I woke up just as my mother got home from the overnight shift at Kmart. When you're young and you're in a hurry, the meaning of moments like this escape you. But now, as my children get older, I understand it better. My dad used to tell us, in este país, ustedes van a poder lograr todas las cosas que nosotros no pudimos. In this country, in this country, you're going to be able to accomplish all the things we never could. A few years ago, during a speech, I noticed a bartender behind a portable bar in the back of the ballroom. I remembered my father, who worked for many years as a banquet bartender. He was grateful for the work he had, but that's not the life he wanted for us. You see, he stood behind the bar and in the back of the room all those years. So one day I could stand behind a podium in the front of a room. see here um, in both these speeches by Martinez and Rubio is we see a predominantly white audience taking pleasure in the racial and gendered performances of these two subjects. And I think it's significant, I think in part because I think a lot of the literature on race and conservative politics tends to focus on how the right has an aversion to race. Right? Racial aversion is sort of the defining, um, an aversion to race and on diversity, <clears throat> the fact that the country is demographically transforming itself. But, and I think that's not wrong, but I'm also interested in the pleasures of multicultural conservatism, right, conservatism. What is, which is not to say that racial aversion, particularly in forms of like anti-black racism, don't exist. They do, they operate, we should talk about them. I'd like to talk about them in the Q&A. It's not that that's not circulating here. But I believe that Latino Republicans like Rubio and Martinez are acutely aware of their significance and appeal. And they, for, they perform a version of Latino embodiment that alludes to larger racial themes while rarely referring explicitly to race. Right? So in this way, Rubio and Martinez are able to simultaneously embrace a colorblind language of individual agency while mobilizing the aesthetic pleasure and effective power of conservative multiculturalism for their audience. So by appearing on the RNC stage, Latino Republicans create a reassuring narrative of electoral diversity and electoral possibility. Moreover, the ideological diversity of these Latino representatives, ranging from Martinez, a former Democrat, to the far-right Cruz, offer Republicans a vision of unity within diversity, <clears throat> requiring no confrontation with the party's stubborn racial tensions and ideological contradictions. So by featuring prominent Latino Republicans at the RNC, the GOP sought to highlight its success in promoting promising Latino political talent. But I also want to suggest that Latino representatives here are working to neutralize ideological fissures within the GOP through an aesthetic appeal based on racial presence. By having presence stand in for policy, Latino Republican politicians make representative, representative claims aimed at Latinos by offering stories of their parents and their difficulties, as well as sharing their own experiences with poverty, struggle, and success. <laughs> so rather than talk about policies to alleviate poverty or inequality, Latino representatives of the RNC try to use their stories and their presence to embody their commitments to Latino success and prosperity. So that's what I mean by you know, presence over policy, right? There's a way in which they're trying to sort of say by their very active embodiment, they're trying to show a commitment to Latino success. But it's one that's, of course, different than the policy, than the, you know, it has an interesting kind of gap there with policy, or, or at least a, a, a different interpretation of what kinds of policies are necessary for Latino success and, 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 um, and empowerment. So partly what I'm suggesting here takes us back to somebody a lot of political scientists would know, political theorists, 
um, which is Hannah Pitkin. And Hannah Pitkin's famous claim about representation is she says, representation is the idea of making something present that is absent. Right, that's a key definition of representation, making something present that is absent. In that sense, Latino Republicans are seeking to conjure a conservative Latino majority that is not yet present. By appealing to a constituency that has yet to fully materialize, the diverse representative claims, I think, being put forward by Martinez, Sandoval, Rubio, and Cruz, I think, are already making available new ways of thinking politically about the interests and perspectives of Latinos. And I'm out of time here, so I'll stop now. So thanks. well through the fog of perceptions. So what do you think? Could the gringos think of the Hispanics as Caucasian? Well, or the like, yeah. Latinos even, not Hispanics, Latinos. Mm -hmm. uh, do they see them as Caucasians? Man. I think the racial, because Latino is not a race, I think there's a bunch of really interesting <laughs> things going on here. I mean, right. one of the things I was looking at a lot of um, I'll go back to the slideshow. When I when you um, when you look, for example, at um, um, some of the um, when you look at the Republican websites and they show Latino families, they <coughs> consistently show um, light skinned families, mm -hmm. right? They consistently show um, they consistently show right they consistently show very very light skinned families. You often couldn't tell they're Latino. Sometimes you can. And so it's interesting how is you know I'm interested. We were talking about this in Ben's class today. Is like what is the politics of whiteness and Latinidad, uh -huh. right? And what's the story? And you don't see, for example, you see no Afro Latinos on any of these websites. You see, and there's you know you see no the, the black presence within Latino communities is, is absent from their from their images. And so so I think this question of of, of how whiteness will circulate and how is whiteness an available discourse for Latinos and has it always been and it, to what segments and to what segments it's not is a really interesting question. Mm -hmm. Right, right. No, they're individuals who can do themselves, but yeah, but I think what's interesting is just the way they, they, uh, they embody the kind of classic Latino family, right? And that might change too. I mean, they might become more increasingly available to utilize that and then what will that do, right? So, so I, I'm I don't disagree with anything in your talk necessarily, but my, my question is, what, yeah. what, what exactly is, is really the puzzle here? Because these are, these are convention speeches that you're looking at and other right. rhetoric like this, where you don't expect policy content. You don't, you ex and you mm -hmm. don't expect necessarily, I mean, there's, you know, appeals, the appeals to race will be very, super, they're not going to talk about policies that divide the party. And, and mm -hmm. I would say that, we think that when Democrats or non-Latino Republicans talk about other things. It, it would be, it would be similar. And there was a second part of this question. Um, and you know, you know, and, Martinez, yeah. and even yeah. Martinez's rhetoric, right? These are very American themes. These right. are not. Um, I mean, had a you know, you could imagine a, a non-Latino speaker saying the same words. So rather than reading in, reading mm -hmm. with, you know, being, being the positive political yeah, scientist yeah. I am, yeah. you're reading way too much into it. Right? <laughs> what, what would you say to that argument? Yeah, to say a cigar is just a cigar. And, no, there's a couple of really important points you're making. One is um, the weirdness of the RNC speech. And so why look at convention speeches at all? Because they are these kind of, you know, generalizable visions. They don't. They're not. They're not specific. One of the interesting things at the DNC is they, um, every time they had Latino speakers, they had them explicitly support immigration reform. They had them sort of ally themselves with a certain kind of policy commitment. But because it's a hot button issue on this side of the on this side of the party, right? Because it's a hot button, unresolved, divisive issue, right? Um, my interest has to do with um, it's a couple of things. I think that I do think there's something really interesting about the dissonance between racial embodiment and the policy and the policy narratives that are coming out or the, or, the, or the political stories they're narrating about Latino identity, right? And I think they're non, the, 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 lack of, the lack of naming it is powerful rather than just an omission. So I, I do think that's something I'm arguing is worth thinking about and thinking about how it operates on people. Part of the reason I got turned on to this project, I got interested in this project was because is a general sense I've had um, that I'm trying to figure out if it's true or not, which is that I think the right has been better at mobilizing affect than the left. Mm -hmm. And I'm just really interested in the way that um, conservative politics seems to be um, more um, effectively infused 
than, than left politics. And I'm trying to understand why that, why that is. And I'm not sure if people agree with that idea, but I think there's something about the way that they've been able to mobilize emotional politics um, and the politics of emotion. But I also don't want to think about the politics of emotion as sort of irrational politics either. So part of this is also, I, I sort of draw on Sharon Krause's work and you know, the fact that I don't think that when we talk about people being animated by their affective commitments, that that's somehow simply irrational. It, it's capable of being irrational, but it's not necessarily irrational. Right, you could be mobilized by emotion. So partly I was interested in that question. And then I guess the third thing I would say that kind of intrigues me about this is um, I think we're at a really interesting political moment, and I'll be talking about this more tomorrow, but I think we're at a really interesting moment in which we're seeing an, an increased amount of racial diversity, and we're seeing an increased amount of descriptive representation, but we are not seeing an increase in necessarily racial or gender justice, right? And on the one sense, you could say, well, duh. Obviously, you know, of course, um, it's not, that wasn't going to equal that. But I think a lot of, I think among a lot of progressives, there was a kind of assumption that um, uh, having a Congress that looks like America, having more diversity, was going to, you know, involve having more just policies for those communities. And I think that the actual reality of that presence, which I think is necessary for democracy, doesn't necessarily guarantee certain kinds of policy outcomes. And I think we kind of knew that at one level, but I think in the Obama era, the, and the era of Sarah Palin's, and even as we think of Hillary Clinton running, I think we are increasingly in a world where there's more elite diversity alongside massive racial and gender inequalities on the ground that we need to think about. And I think studying Latino conservatives is a way of getting at that <coughs> issue. Um, but I'm not sure if that, but I mean, I think that part of this is that they are using, they're, you, I think you're right, they're using American kind of conversion narratives. They're drawing on very American narratives. And if you look at Julian Castro's speech at the DNC, it sounds an enormous, it sounds, it sounds a great deal like um, Marco Rubio's speech, which I think is actually interesting, right, it, how that even operates. But I think that, um, yeah, so I think that in some ways, yeah, they, they are pulling on certain kinds of critiques that are, that are available beyond the right-left divide. Well, talking about moments in time, it's, it's amazing that you're speaking to us today about voting in the state of Wisconsin where two bills are being pushed in to regulate uh, and to minimize uh, voting rights. Uh, we had two bills that came up uh, down the street today, which, which is very worrisome. I also appreciate that, I like to say that I appreciate that you're looking at some of the funding sources. Mm -hmm. um, Marco, Marco Rubio gets enormous amounts of funds from GEO, mm -hmm. the prison industrial complex that runs the detention camps, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I think we need to do more research on that. Yeah, yeah, oh, thank you. I mean, I think, I think the voting rights stuff is really interesting to me, and one thing I'm, I mean, again, because it's this weird contradiction, or is it, what, how much of a contradiction is it, or what kind of logic is going on when it comes to voter suppression, right, because on the one hand, the Republican Party still likes to show African-American faces up there, but they've kind of given up on the electorate. For Latinos, there's still this hope of, a, of, a, of appealing to a certain segment of this electorate. Um, yet they're still engaged in massive voter um, suppression, which will disproportionately affect Latinos. So um, that and that sort of that, that logic is, I think, really important. And I think one thing I'm trying to think about right now as I study the right, and one thing I've been figuring out over the course of this year is that this has to be a story of the right, and Latino Republicans are a part of it. But it can't just be about Latino. It has to be about a story of the right overall, the conservative movement. And conservatives, I think, right now are having a really troubled relationship to the language of majoritarianism. Because they, they, they're not the majority anymore in a lot of ways. Like, I mean, at least in terms of certain demographic groups, right, they're, or they're struggling with, I think there's a language that you might have thought about in the Nixon era where they were the silent majority. I think the language now is more that they're like the true Americans. And they're like, they're almost, they, they're almost using a vanguard language a lot of the time. I mean, I'm really, I'm really interested in the kind of radicalness of the right right now. Like, and, and the fact that they are using a kind of vanguard language, which is different than saying you're the majority. You represent what's real and authentic and what's true about the country's principles, but that doesn't necessarily adhere to being the majority. And I think if you believe that, right, then voter suppression becomes about how do you sustain the real America, right? And so it's a different relationship to majorities. And I'm, so I'm really trying to figure out, like, what is that logic of majority? So I think thinking about voter suppression would be really helpful. But Jimmy? Um, I have a question about uh, um, the representation, um, qua representation of yeah. subordination, right? Because the, yeah. in the Rubio speech, it was really fascinating that he is not saying 
no one should be a career banquet bartender. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, this is a, this is, this is not the kind of, um, you know, uh, the, not the kind of life we want for anyone, right? right. He's saying instead, um, you know, he's, he's representing the importance of someone having done this, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. this being an important function within a convention, right? right? I mean, it's a subordinate, but it's still represented, yeah. right? So yeah. there's something curious about the representation of um, the what might be perceived as um, class inequalities yeah. within, uh, as, as part of a narrative of, of, of Latinidad, right? I mean, yeah. so yeah. I, yeah. I don't know what to do with that, but that's related to what you were saying about the, um, the, the, the uh, representation of presence, a uh, representation yeah. as presence versus the question of inequality and injustice. Yeah, yeah. No, I think that's really helpful because I think that one thing I'm really interested in that narrative is he treats it like it's a kind of necessary sacrifice. Like a ne it's like a, it's just a necessary act of suffering. You know, and, and if you can see the whole speech, and I encourage you to watch these on YouTube if you have nothing but time because you know, they're wild. But, but his speech, bef right before then, he's narrated like, maybe you, viewer, or somebody who's lost your job or you've lost your pension. And he sort of narrates all these losses, and then he sort of pivots to his story of his father's losses and these sort of sacrifices. And the fact he talks about his mother working at Kmart and working these unbelievably awful hours, and the story for him isn't, no one should have to work like that. You know, no one should have to have, you know, no one should have a, a situation like that. It's, it's instead the story of like all that sacrifice was generated to, to propel me to the front of the room. And so there is this kind of inevitability story of a kind of sacrifice narrative that one has to go through this, this sort of this necessary suffering. But you can sort of give yourself solace of suffering because it's part of this American story of your children doing better than you, or, or you know, um, yeah, I don't know what people think of it. But. Just exactly yeah. going off your point, this, um, I feel like that um, the appeal of Cruz to a broader um, conservative audience is precisely this, um, that he keeps the dream of ethnic succession alive, right? Yeah. And that is so much part of our national story. You mm -hmm. know, my Polish grandmother worked yeah. 50 hours a week as a maid. And so that, yeah. I feel like yeah. that does two things. First, it allows the disavowal of racism because it's like, well, the, you know, I can, I can, I can get on board with Rubio mm -hmm. um, and his family, and so what I don't want are these parasitical immigrants mm -hmm. who are just coming mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, right. to, are to and, draw babies yeah. or whatever, mm -hmm. right? So, so there's that, and then it's also, it's also very appealing to think that ethnic succession and cl in the the economic way that Jimmy is talking about. Is still alive in the way that it was in the you know mm -hmm. in the 20s, 30s, 40s, yeah. right? Yeah. Whereas you know actually class mobility is is practically at a standstill. So yeah. I think yeah. that story about class is important. In terms yeah, of and I need to play that out because you know there, it, it's because it, 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 in a way it's an inevitable story. Right? There's sort of an inevitability to success yeah. as much as an inevitability of suffering. And one thing I'm really trying to make sense of when they, in reading the literature that they're so, so they've written and looking at the, the websites and some of these leaders' descriptions is, is this interesting combination of necessary suffering combined with this radical sense of self-mastery and self-sovereignty and agency. Like they also tell the story of like my family, we did it without any, you know, they never talk about um, any kind of support you get from a, a union or any, all forms of support are family. It's very grounded in that. So, so this interesting idea of and it appeals to the immigrant narrative because I think immigrants are a population that have transformed their lives, right? They can, they, people have real memories of like, I was here and I, through my choices, I transformed my life in some really critical way and that might have a real resonance, right? Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. Um, in my African American political theory class, we're going over, um, or we just went over black conservatism and that kind of reads as a little bit ridiculous. Like, there, like this notion of pulling up with your, like pulling yourself up with your bootstraps doesn't really Mm -hmm. resonate with the black community. Mm -hmm. Is there something about the, um, like, perhaps the broad range of Hispanics in, in America, mm -hmm. or the, the Hispanic experience in general that makes it resonate more with Hispanics or a little bit less ridiculous? Mm -hmm. that's, a great, that's a great question. I mean, I think what's interesting is the way that, I mean, Angela Dillard's work, where she looked at some of these black conservative journals, that were published, and so on the one hand, the efforts to actually become part of the GOP, right, and, and the party, when the, how did the party of Lincoln become, become the party of, you know, it's Strom Thurmond, and it's, you know, and the, the, so the break in the party um, after the passage of the Civil Rights Act. Um, one of the things she's looking at is how black conservative, conservative thought finds kind of a home, and they can still vote Democratic. So there can be these maybe conservative 
politics circulating in those communities, but they still partisan-wise vote as Democrats, right? Um, and I think, you know, I think one of the, the really big breaks is um, the fact that the party broke along civil rights issues, right? I mean, the party itself, I mean, you, that famous moment when LBJ, as he signs the Civil Rights Act, he says, we just lost the South for a generation. Like, they knew that in standing with civil rights and sort of no longer maintaining the, the impossible compromise of, of, you know, the Democratic Party for so long that had Southern Democrats in it, and, um, you know, the, the, that idea, like, they couldn't do that anymore. They just couldn't sustain it. So, I mean, I think those histories are really important. You know, and I think the history with Latino, you know, one thing I'm trying to understand now and look at is, you know, the history of Latinos in the Republican Party seems like a history that's really state-based. Um, and, and again, I think one of the interesting things about Latino politics in general is, is um, the need to think about things, that, things like the state and local level. Because you don't necessarily have like Jim Crow politics that cross <coughs> the whole country. So you have very specific like, you know, Jim Crow conditions in Texas, but then you might have different kinds of conditions in New Mexico. And so, that, I think, you know, is part of what's interesting. But what I'm interested in, too, is the fact that Dillard's work is interesting because she's noting the fact that there are these conservative voices within these communities, but that they still manage to find a home in the Democratic Party as voters, which is not to say there isn't conservative politics circulating. Yeah. Um, another sort of shadow in the success narratives is, a, is an anti-victim narrative. Mm -hmm. That is, I think, uh, the implicit claim is that if you're whining, it's because you are a failure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and it's part of the general Republican effort to delegitimize any grievance from, uh, around social justice right. by, by, by having just this individualistic success narrative. Yeah, yeah. And you see that in all, so much of this discussion where they'll say, Ted Cruz has this famous thing in here where he says, you know, you know, thank God some government bureaucrat didn't come in and talk to my, um, if you come to the seminar, I guess, that I'm doing on Thursday, I, I send out the speeches. And if you read them, you see him talking about, you know, I've, oh, my father had been met up by this bureaucrat who had turned him into a victim. And so, and so, and one thing I'm really interested in around, like, Latino conservatives is, so with the GOP, you have a story of sort of uh, takers and makers, right? And, and the takers are racialized often, right? Uh, welfare mothers and welfare queens, um, immigrants, Right, so there's these sort of racialized takers in the story. Um, and then this story of trying to be, like you're saying, like an anti. And I think for the Latino conservatives, what's interesting is they have to talk about themselves as anti-victims. And they also, I think, want to talk about themselves as, um, as tempted, by, tempted by victim politics, but then they resist it. Like they, they, so it's a different story than just those people over there are takers. It's this story of, thank God we didn't become takers. Mm -hmm. Like, I was, I was, you know, kind of almost being seduced by that language of the big, big government, but I, with, I, I, with, I withdrew from it. So even Cruz's thing is, like, thank God my, my father wasn't, like, seduced into the welfare state, basically. And he, with, he, he, he sort of was strong enough to not get sucked in. So I think that's something really interesting. It's not just an other. It's kind of this story of resistance to becoming that thing, which is sort of intriguing. 40 days yeah. in the desert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and you come out and you're okay. The class narratives mm -hmm. are entirely about mobility, not about condition. Yeah, yeah, I think a lot of it is. Whereas right. in the Democratic Party, the class narratives are about condition, at least mm -hmm. as much as, I mean, there's, there's the mobility narratives as well, but it's, right. it's also about suffering, uh, unredeemed suffering. Right, and unacceptable, and the, and the non-necessity of that kind of right. suffering, right? Like, I think that, you know, and I think, I think this, the, the both parties, you know, they, they, these are from American self-making tropes that, you know, that get, they both partake in. So, right. so in the contrast then with African American, maybe part of what's going on is that's such bull, you know, the Republican <laughs> thing is such transparent bullshit for the African American experience. Mm -hmm. Whereas for a recent, so the recent immigrants, they themselves have experienced mm -hmm. moving mm -hmm. in an effort to do better, and many have comparisons back home right. that at least make it not as complete fantasy land as the um, yeah. that same narrative when it's directed to them. Yeah, I yeah. Remember. I wonder, it's interesting because I mean Annie's point about the fact that you know we're in a moment now of massive you know income inequality and, and stagnation of people's ability to, to move from one class to another, right? And that's the reality demographically, but yet people still have stories as immigrants um, whose families are who those families that are recent immigrants can can um, often can draw on these stories of of self-transformation. And that's something else I'm, I'm sort of interested in here is I think that the left, 
is better, and I should be clear about like the difference between left and liberal, you know, liberals and left on the left, those are different things, but, but certainly there's a story that progressives or liberals will tell about structural inequality, right? Like the structural institutional racism, structural inequality, right? But the right always talks about agency and self-making. Right? And the, the ability for, you know, you can, you know, if you dream it, you can make it happen. And that kind of story of, you know, if you think you can do this, you can do this. And that's constantly being referenced. And, and um, I think there's something really interesting about, um, one thing I'm interested in is like, how can the, how does, how do progressives not let, we shouldn't see the language of agency and self-making. And I wonder if we sometimes do, how do we talk about structural inequality and the capacity for self-making? Because people are very, um, most of us all feel like we want to be in control of our lives and we, that the choices we make matter. And so how, we need to be able to talk about that politically, you know, and, and, and that bad choices have, sometimes have bad outcomes. The analog so, for the left as opposed to liberals is yeah. solidarity and struggle. Yeah, it's yeah. We make it, not the... It's a we. So, yeah. I mean, the, the left has a rich vocabulary and yeah. music and whatever that celebrates... That's a great point, yeah. ...struggle, but the liberal... Liberals are more uncomfortable with yeah. that yeah. language for That's a great point. Because maybe that's part of the issue, right? Maybe liberals have neither the language of solidarity nor the language of agent, agentic self-making. Yeah. So they have neither sovereignty nor, you know, and so that leaves, you know, and hence the DNC <laughs> speeches. So I'm really interested in the comp comparison to African Americans, but that also raises the other comparisons, um, say, to European Americans and their experience. So, I mean, it's a silly, you know, picking up on what you said at the beginning, to lump Latinos together as it is to, it's just as silly to lump all whites together. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, if, even if, just thinking about it in this way, that if you were to take a representative sample of all Latin Americans and plop them down in the United States, you'd have, I mean, the Salvadoran election right now is completely split between the extreme right and the mm -hmm. FMLN, mm -hmm. or Chile that has a huge right Right. Wing. You can have um, all these so the the question is, you know, how to, to to what degree have you thought about a comparison to the to the ideological experiences of whites, the immigration patterns, the degree to which certain ethnic groups found themselves <coughs> in certain urban settings and got integrated into certain political machines? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, there seem to be a whole slew of of, his, of variables that differ historically, and what difference do those differences make yeah. in terms of the degree, the way in which people are integrated into the political process and the choices yeah. they make? Yeah, no, that's a great, that's a great question. I think it's, it's also really true that, I think, you know, one of the debates, whenever I teach Latino politics, I always say that, you know, in some ways, that the conversation sometimes turns into, like, Latinos, are they black or are they Italian? Like, are they gonna act like, you know, US ethnics, like racial ethnics, and the sort of narratives of racial ethnicity and immigration, and assimilation in that story, um, or are they going to be like African Americans? It's a story of conquest and colonialism, and you can see that story play out. Like you look at someone like Linda Chavez's work, and she wants to make you know Hispanics or Italians, and she wants to sort of tell the the race, the immigrant story, you know. And, and Linda Martin Alcoff has written about this, where she talks about like this is the weirdness of being a population that she uses the term ethno race. Like we need like an ethno racial language because it's both a story of conquest and colonialism and racialization, and it's a story of immigration and you know and so that those stories so that for me the question's always been like are Latinos black or, or Italian are they are they like blacks or like Italians and I'm kind of like yes yeah <laughs> you know yes which and I, speaks to these class differences and racial differences and and we were talking in um, in best class earlier about you know the, the enormous out marriage rates right that are happening in some and again happening in some segments not others but but the fact that some huge percentage of Latinos are marrying non Latinos right they're marrying Asian Americans African Americans a white a lot of white um, intermarriage, and so that's part of this growing Hispanic population. And you were reading Haney's work, right? Like, I mean, this, it's like, as that, hap as that population grows, um, what Latino means politically to the people who inhabit that category is, incre is just increasingly diverse. And so I think that set of questions of which, um, which narratives will resonate with different segments of these communities, and which segments of these communities might find themselves attracted to Republican politics, and what segments are finding themselves in much more racialized, uh, working class, um, maybe exploited conditions, and maybe don't find that resonant at all. Um, but that's why I've always, I don't, I don't, that's why I've never liked the term the Latino community. It's not a, it's not a, it's a series of communities, 
it's, it's communities, it's plural, and, and trying to think about it, and I think it's a plural community, a set of communities that's increasingly pluralizing. So, um, but yeah, I wonder if it would be interesting to look at a particular case study against. So could you go back to the slide about the institutions that you're planning to look yeah, at? Sure. So one of the things I'm really curious about is the sort of um, recruitment process, yes. and I'm wondering to what extent that figures in your project, and I mean, thinking about this story of, mm -hmm. you know, going to lunch and realizing that I'm a Republican, yeah. and this sort of representation that's happening or playing out in, you know, finding local, state, national candidates for office. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, can you see more like, so you're trying to figure out sort of... Well, I'm just, I'm curious to what extent that will feature in your... The, 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 the personalized and contact and, and the narratives. Yeah. I think it's, it, I, I haven't really gotten, I've been researching the organizations and trying to find out what the archives are and if they have archives. And, you know, one of the frustrating things is some of these organizations that I'm looking at are, um, um, don't have the richest archives. So a lot of it is in interviewing folks. And so that's something I'll be doing, um, which is new for me. It's, it's, it's more, more on the socials. I, I, you know, I tend to um, do historical work and then theoretical work on top of it. So like actually interviewing people is like, oh, um, and that's not my new thing. But um, I think it will be really interesting to, t to find out about like what is the what is the discourse of cultivation they have? How are they trying to cultivate leaders? And and what is the relationship between leaders and an electorate? Like that, I think is a is a not always clear um, representation. Because I mean, when you think about the fact that like. You know, I'm really interested in sort of the aesthetic pleasure of race that conservatives have. I mean, that when, when they applaud Marco Rubio speaking Spanish, I was just so taken aback by that. Because, like, this is, the, this is the party that passes anti, you know, English-only legislation. Yeah, yeah. And yet they're like, that's great. You know, you can tell that they would keep <laughs> applauding if he didn't stop them. He's, they're kind of taken by his story, so he, they, he stops it. But they would have applauded that for a little while. And that's really interesting to me, right? Like, so, so that dissonance, right, between, an aver, you know, aversion and, and appeal, right, that, that's going on. But I, I think a lot of... Um, uh, when you hear, I was looking at Reince Priebus's, the what's known as now is like the Republican Autopsy Report, they published in March of last year, where they were trying to say like, why did we get hammered so badly? Mm -hmm. And one of the arguments about appealing to Latinos is a lot about this kind of face-to-face -face contact, this one-on-one -on -one conversations. Like, what always strikes me is that they, it's totally devoid of policy. It's like if they get to know us then they'll, they'll come to a respect that what we're about. But there's no sense of like, maybe our, you know, the only thing Previs does say is we've got to do something about immigration. Right? We've got to deal with that issue. And then of course that didn't happen. So, so it's interesting, but, but I think there is a lot of language of sort of the face-to-face. -face, um, well, which is the sense of like, who is capable of engaging in that kind of face-to-face -face mm -hmm. conversation. Yeah, yeah, but, but somehow weirdly, weirdly devoid of content. Like they don't talk about like this policy has to happen or this and I you know and yeah so there's something very interesting about the the, the absence of, of what's inside of what's happening at the face to face level whereas at least in Martinez's narrative it's her discovery ideologically that she's more on their side so at least hers has some sort of content involved in it sometimes it just seems to sort of weirdly devoid of of what they believe in you know a lot of previous stuff in the autopsy report he says um, you know people who vote for us don't have to agree with 100 percent of what we stand for. They can agree with 80% of what we stand for. So he's already kind of seeding the fact that people don't agree with their policies. Like he's like, but that's okay. They'll vote, they can vote for us for other reasons. And, the, and so he talked about Chris Christie and he was really excited before Chris Christie exploded um, with the bridge scandal. But before that he was sort of saying, isn't it interesting how Chris Christie, you know, he's like, look, Democrats in, in New Jersey don't agree with Chris Christie on policies, but they voted for him anyway. And that's really, so he was like the exciting image for them, and I think that's so interesting. It's not like he's saying they agree, it's that the man... Yeah. Maybe you read the aesthetics of representation idea, because <laughs> that's also contentless, right? Yeah, it's yeah. He was strong, sandy, you so know. It's just about, it's just about self-presentation, not about, um, it's about the, yeah. rather than about the content. But yeah. that also then means that, that I was uncomfortable a little with your how strongly you identified with that notion of representation rather than representation as having content. Yeah, yeah. Because I think it's both not just right. aesthetics and not just framing in a kind of symbolic, abstract way. But right, that we have to look at. No, I totally agree with you. In fact, tomorrow, tomorrow's not. Um, one thing I'm really, one reason I'm interested in aesthetics and I went to aesthetics is both because I wanted to, I needed a language or I wanted a language that looks at the visible, the politics of presence and visibility. Um, and I wanted to think about that question. But I also, and I think also aesthetics is a place where we talk about aesthetic dissonance, 
right? Like where we can like like a movie, even if it's violent, and we don't believe in violence, but we can be like enjoy the Matrix. And you know, like that there's there's these weird, interesting aesthetic dissonances we experience when we can like something in one sense, but politically not like it, or we have issues with it. That dis aesthetics is a place where we talk about that dissonance, and so that was appealing to me. But aesthetics was also interesting because it highlights the importance of judgment. And so that's something I didn't get to talk about today, and I want to talk about more tomorrow, is the idea of judgment. That I think learning to read what we see, like a lot of what aesthetic theory, at least I think, has the possibility of offering, is the, a language that talks about things not just being self-evident, but you have to learn how to make judgments about what you're seeing and interpreting what you're seeing. And in a way, I think you're, I think you're totally right, that when you look at this diverse picture of bodies out there, and you see Sarah Palin, and you see Michelle Bachman, and you see Hillary Clinton, and you see, how do we learn to read what we're seeing? How do we learn to interpret what we're seeing? And it has to be more than just performance and preference. Yes, but it also has to be patronage jobs. Because that's how <laughs> material, you material, material things. Yeah, and uh, have you looked at how the, are the Republicans are, I, I don't think mm -hmm. they're, they're giving, giving out those patronage jobs. And I, I don't know how they can fill their electorate that way. Yeah, so, so that's Maybe something. I've been too close to Chicago politics. <laughs> <laughs> but for you, you're like, there's stuff. And you know, maybe, I mean, maybe materialism is too. Like, I mean, if you're a Republican and you're a conservative and you're of color, you will be on the fast track to leadership. So that's certainly one kind of material incentive, but you know, you're not, you're not wrong. And I study education, right? And I think that um, in education, a lot of people have started to study how the right has totally appealed to um, families of color that have been not served in public schooling, right? right Chicago is right. a choice. example. And so that's a material thing. Like, look, here's this charter school. Um, it's going to be publicly funded, mm -hmm. <laughs> but there's this agenda behind this charter school. But they're appealing to like the folks that are in those communities, right, that have for so long not been served by a public institution. Mm -hmm. So I think, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, my question to you is kind of like, are you going to look at some of that like policy work that is happening on the right too, or yeah, not I, as I do. I do want to look at that. I think school choice is going to be a hugely interesting place because that's certainly yeah. a really interesting, a really interesting space. I mean, right now, a lot of the organizations I've been looking at their on their policies. They're very focused on Obamacare, mm -hmm. and trying to make a case. The Libre Initiative is trying to really push how this is that healthcare, the healthcare reforms are bad for Latinos, which is, um, and so that's, and it's not really working because disproportionately working class population has been in need of healthcare and have big healthcare discrepancies, but that's their argument. So yeah, they've been very focused, but school choice has been a huge issue. Yeah, it's such an interesting narrative, and uh, you know, it's like this common sense narrative, right, mm -hmm. which when you were saying the language of structural inequality doesn't really resonate to like, kind of like, you know, if you go out on the street and you try to explain to someone like structural inequality, right? Like, yeah. they're like, what are you talking about? Let's yeah. break it down. But someone from the right can, it uses this common sense, sense language about choice. And Individual. Individualism yeah. and effort, you know, and mm -hmm. meritocracy. And like, those are, those are narratives that have circulated for so long. They're so ingrained in this country. Um, that they appeal so much. Yeah, right? they get picked up. No, I think you're yeah. exactly right, and I think what's really interesting is this, I think, is where they can get a real wedge in, is when, when if Democrats speak the language of the public good, but the public good has failed people. Yeah. Yeah. If a public good has failed people, then an alternative language can become very attractive because it's a language of, of pri maybe maybe that's the answer private private funding and private an individual initiative and so um, so how do you sustain a language of a public good when people feel like publics have they don't they don't they haven't been so they haven't been served well by any kind of public you know how do you um, well I always wanted to ask more about the body uh, the body dynamics of conservatives and liberals mm -hmm. what I'm, what is my take and is that. They are not as much influenced by race as they are by representation. Mm -hmm. So, um, in that sense, uh, what, that's why we're seeing Ted Cruz and uh, this other lady, Susan. Susan, Susan, Susan. Yeah, um, not being, uh, the, uh, not having as much of the uh, Latin voting, uh, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because the, their uh, Latins are not voting necessarily for the race as much as they are voting for who is representing their interest. Mm -hmm. I don't think the population should be seen as a blind. Uh, um, no, the population is not a blind subject. Like, oh yeah, we're just we're, we're just a big a, a pan a pan a, a yeah, and group, and we're just gonna vote for anyone who looks like us. Yeah. So they are uh, yeah. so voting more for who is representing them. And what I, and uh, also another really interesting thing that you mentioned about the uh, Latinos who are thriving in the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. I see it more as a a legally uh, a legally of. Um, 
when when someone says, "Yeah, I'm not racist. I'm not racist. I have a black friend." <laughs> I think that's a, that's a way for them to uh, make sense of that dissonance of a uh, mm -hmm. yeah. We're not we're not a, we're not uh, even even though we're a majority white uh, party, we are not racist. We have Latinos. Yeah, here. look, Condoleezza Rice. You know, yeah, yeah it's fine. Yeah. It's, no, that's that's a great. It's a great. There's two great points you made. I mean, one I think is you're right. I think there there is a there can be an incredibly cynical use of of the visual, right? The, the very cynical use of aesthetic, like you know, look, we have one of yours. You know, look, you know, we're we're Latino adjacent, so it's you're fine. You know, you're you know support us because we have them here. You know, and the fact that maybe is is part of the story here that Latino voters are smarter than that. They learn. They know how to read who they see, and they make ideological choices because they can decide that. You know, at the same time, um, you know, voters are so moved often by the, the person. I mean, the, that you have some voters who are very ideological and some voters who are either low information or independent voters who can be drawn to, um, um, to, the, to just a racial appeal, right? But I think you're right, it does speak to the fact that Latino voters are very smart about what, uh, maybe a lot of Latino voters are saying, well, this is my interest, this is what I support. Um, I think that, um, so yeah, I think that you can see that starting to happen in terms of um, how they're trying to manage that. But I also think you're inter what you said there about authorizing, um, that having Latino conservatives there authorizes certain claims to get made, and then they don't have to be construed as racist, right? So if you say, you're, if, you're, if Ted Cruz talks about amnesty, that doesn't operate in the same way as, um, you know, than as McCain talking about amnesty, right? So, so it, it does provide certain kinds of um, open possibilities to, to have, make certain critiques. And so that also really interests me is thinking about whiteness as that kind of project, right? And who gets to articulate things that get to sustain. I mean, one thing I'm interested in is how these conservatives can kind of make certain kinds of claims and they, it allows them to sort of, um, how do I want to put it? They, they, it allows them to make certain kinds of claims that, um, authorize whiteness in ways that, that allow them to continue doing that. So for example, they can articulate a certain vision that's very conservative, but because of all that, because of their presence, it doesn't get challenged, right? So they can talk about diversity without any kind of structural change, right? They can talk about diversity without structural inequality. And a lot of these speeches, you see them talking about, um, yeah, various forms of diversification, but it, none of it's focused on actual structural difference. So people get sort of the pleasure of multiculturalism without any of the actual challenges to racial hierarchies, and right? Then, so that that is partly what I yeah you start to see. And I've seen the same strategy used uh, along uh, different type of minority groups mm -hmm. uh, that include, for example, using a gay uh, candidates to uh, promote promote the idea that uh, uh, to use them to promote the idea that uh, gay marriage is bad. So mm -hmm. when, when the gay candidate is saying, or the gay uh, representative is saying, yeah, this is bad. Oh yeah, I'm not saying it because I'm, uh, I'm, I'm gay, I'm gay yeah. because I'm gay. <laughs> I'm saying it because I truly think it's bad. Yeah. So that uh, sort of give, gives it authority to speak for the broader population, even if it actually doesn't. Right. Just by belonging to, uh, to one group doesn't give you necessarily the authority to yeah. be the speaker of that group. Yeah, but it gives, there's this incredibly authorizing narrative. And it's funny because in academic worlds, we, we have critiques of experience, we have critiques of identity, but it's really interesting how flat-footed that language can be in the public sphere, right? Like, I mean, I think if Hillary Clinton runs, I mean, I'm terrified of the discussion around gender that's going to happen from that comment. Women are more naturally this, and it's going to, it's going to be really bad. Um, it's going to be really interesting. And, um, but one point you made really quickly, Matt Barreto's work in his, in his recent book, one thing he talks about is um, a certain percentage of Latino voters who, who are attracted to people who make racial, um, you know, racial cues that appeal to Latinos. That, and he talks about it as you know, sort, of, um, sort of using kind of our community language and how that can resonate with voters. And so for a certain kind of voter, again, especially, I mean, I'm thinking, I'm, the group that interests me in a lot of ways around all this stuff is not so much ideologues, right? Because there's the 25% of Latinos who always vote conservative, they, that's what they do, right? And those who are really Democrats, it's that 15% that are kind of low information, I, I often think of them as low information voters, but voters who are maybe less ideologically committed, who are independent voters, can be very attracted to people based on, on their appearance. That, you know, Chris Christie is tough, and he cares about, you know, this or that, and those kinds of appeals can be very, very attractive to that population. And then I think affect and aesthetics really matters. Are we out of time? So tomorrow we have, part two, which is taking place at four o'clock.
we're in the other building, right? No, we're here. We're here. Uh, no, I, I'm not sure, actually. <laughs> I'll talk about no, I believe we're in 8417 Social Science, which you can only, you can't access from the 84, so go straight across and then. Thanks. Thanks so much.